wasn't just business news, we're news for business people. Hello, I'm delighted to be in conversation with Subir Gokan, India's representative to the executive board of the International Monetary Fund in Washington and former Deputy Governor, Reserve Bank of India. Subir, thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So Subir, what uh, I thought we'd do was try to step back and take a big picture view of uh, some of the uh, issues uh, um, from, a, from a macro perspective. And I actually wanted to start with um, your experience with the RBI, but more from a, um, a technical framework. So we, do, we are in a new um, inflation targeting and a monetary policy committee regime. And uh, um, I think the transition has actually been fairly smooth. Some could argue that it's been helped by benign um, oil prices. Um, and, but regardless, the, the point that I wanted to raise with you was one on inflation expectations. And I know you and I have had this conversation before. Inflation expectations become quite important and central to an inflation targeting regime, isn't it? Exactly. And, uh, the RBI's way of measuring inflation expectations today is about, you know, through a survey. Um, and you've, you've been associated with that. Now, how important is the inflation expectations? And um, do we now have to think about how we measure expectations now that we are in this new regime? Right. I think, uh, as you said, uh, the, the uh, capturing of expectations is absolutely central to the inflation targeting regime because the target is not just the immediate rate of inflation, it is also an attempt to bring inflation into a relatively narrow uh, and stable band, whatever the number may be. Uh, so if you are stating 4% or 6% or 3% as a target, uh, you're always gonna be measured in terms of your effectiveness and therefore your credibility in terms of how close you are able to stick to this over a long period of time. Uh, so understanding what is happening with expectations mm -hmm. gives you a sense of your risks, uh, you know, of uh, deviating from that target. And I think that's therefore very important feedback into the whole decision making process. Now there are three ways of, of capturing expectations, mm -hmm. maybe more, but in, in, in the way that I thought about this situation. Mm -hmm. We have the household survey, which is what you're referring right. to. And this started off uh, a few years before I joined. And I think around the 16th round, uh, we decided to publish it to you know, give people a sense of yeah. the technicalities of doing it. And you know, whether it's credible decision. or not. And uh, it was a decision I took, but it was uh, you know brewing. I mean, there was a lot of thinking within the Reserve Bank on whether this should be made public. I was fully in favor of it. Uh, I, I'm certainly a very firm believer in, in transparency and uh, you know uh, this is trying to give markets a, a clear sense of, mm. of uh, what the thinking is. And uh, we did it with that motivation. Mm. Uh, the second element of an expectations framework is a business. And in, we were helped in this by the Industrial Outlook Survey, yeah. which was done for you know, asking companies what they think their input prices are going to look like, what their output prices are going mm -hmm. to look like. So that brings in another uh, dimension into the expectations judgment. And the third is markets. Uh, we did uh, a few years ago introduce uh, inflation-linked bonds. Yeah. Uh, they are not trading Liquid, with yeah. any, you know, any stability or any volume. Uh, but that's a very important element into bringing what the financial markets think or financial players think about sure. inflation. So when you have all these three together, you'll have a fairly robust triangulated uh, mechanism. Uh, by which you can gauge whether inflation expectations are staying on track with your targets or they're deviating. And I think that's the key uh, sort of requirement for an effective inflation targeting framework. Well, it's not going to happen overnight. You have to nurture sure. them, you have to bring them into play. We have the uh, household survey, we have the IOS. Uh, we've, I think, got to get the market piece uh, into some Absolutely. level of yeah. you know uh, efficiency, mm. uh, which I then think will give us a very robust foundation for uh, for implementing this uh, this yeah. inflation yeah. targeting framework. You know the household inflation expectations, and uh, I've done some work on it thanks to your decision to make the data um, available. I've tracked it, and it's actually striking that um, they're quite sticky in the sense, roughly about seventy percent of households believe that 
long-term inflation is going to be in double digits. They think inflation, long-term inflation is you know, greater than double digits, and they expect greater than double digit inflation. And that's been fairly sticky, except for some period of time. Um, you know, in that context, uh, it just becomes extremely hard because right now the RBI's central role should be to uh, temper expectations, right? I mean, through through uh, their measures. And we have an inflation targeting regime, but expectations seem to be fairly sticky and they're fairly high, uh, perhaps given our history. What's, I mean, how, how does, how does one address this? I think the, uh, when we're dealing with that's, uh, me, when we're dealing with households, we have to recognize that the people you ask are going to respond based on their most immediate experience. Correct. So Correct. there's a recency, yeah. uh, and there's a frequency, yeah. you know, dimension to their responses. Uh, what do they buy most frequently? What did they buy most recently? And it's usually food. Yeah. Almost, I'd say, inevitably food. Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, and it's usually uh, vegetables, which you buy, yeah. you know, on yeah. a daily basis. Most, um, uh, almost, even even affluent households tend to buy vegetables very frequently. Uh, so that memory of of what you last yeah. bought is a dominant input into this. So I think we have to accommodate that. Uh, you know, the number is important, but. I think the pattern and the, the persistence is a little more. Is it? Is it? Are they going up? Are they going down? Right. How uh, significantly are vo is volatility in vegetable prices, for example, Correct. shaping expectations? And I think that's an important input into the monetary policy process in terms of deviations. Are they going up? Are they coming down? But because, unless you have the other uh, two elements also contributing to the judgment. Uh, you 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 may be sort of uh, you know missing out mm -hmm. on on a significant part of the puzzle, so I would be less concerned about the number, sure, uh, and sure. more concerned about the the, the, the pattern, yeah, and uh, that is certainly something you want to shape uh, because you know for the average household. Uh, the the index number is of no particular relevance. Correct. It is it Correct. is about uh, so one judgment that you can make from this is how significantly how uh, seriously are uh, food prices and the volatility in food prices uh, sort of causing some disruption or diluting the efforts of the central bank to, so in fact, to manage I have inflation. Some empirical evidence on that. The single biggest um, uh, driver, expl the explanatory variable of household inflation expectations is the previous three month CPI food inflation. Mm -hmm. There you go. So absolutely, yeah. Yes. So it, but unfortunately here in India, that's the most volatile. That is, but uh, as uh, we've been saying, you know, uh, we we can't wait for initial conditions to be perfect before uh, engaging or emerging, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. trading uh, trading down a path. Sure. Uh, so I mean, one can discuss the merits of targeting versus no, a different no, approach yeah. endlessly, and uh, that's no, no, not what we want yeah, to do here. The, the, yeah. I think what we have to recognize once the regime is in place, what are the elements that are going to help it be successful? And I think it is this this triangular perspective on expectations. You've got the households, you've got the firms, and you've got the, the markets. And when we get all these things into place, uh, I think it, it gives us an anchor. And mm. to me, the most important uh, role of that anchor, that, that uh, forward-looking view, is to let us know whether we're having, as a central bank, uh, having an impact on people's thinking. And if if there is some stability there, if there is some sense of you know comfort about uh, the long-term trajectory, is it then going to help them make uh, more meaningful long-term commitments, uh, both in terms of household savings and consumption mm -hmm. patterns, mm -hmm. and in terms of business investment patterns? That's ultimately what you yeah. want to get at. Yeah. Talk about fiscal issues in in um, in India, but more from a rules perspective. We could potentially argue that you know we've we've going through changes in the economy from a policy perspective that you know. Uh, we've we've done so much in the in in two years, be it from you know uh, uh, what we did with the currency or GST or other things like bankruptcy code, and we're trying to deal with NPAs in in a new manner. Um, so there's a uh, view. These are one-time costs to the economy, and during such transition periods, it's okay to relax fiscal prudence. Do you subscribe? Uh, no, I think uh, the, the issue of fiscal prudence uh, sort of transcends in, in individual circumstances. Of course, you can always argue that rules, uh, when they're designed, uh, 
have to accommodate shocks. They have to be flexible enough to, you know, not to lock the government into a situation where it cannot respond to a shock. So I don't think there's any practical rule in place which does not give sure. this flexibility. But yeah. then there have to be very clear you know, uh, boundaries, if you will, or, or understanding on what are the circumstances in which these mm. these uh, uh, rules can be bent, or, or, or you know, where the flexibility comes in. And typically, in rule formation, uh, these flexibilities are given uh, to the government to deal with a very severe exogenous shock, uh, and not a sort of necessarily. And of course, one could debate what an exogenous shock is. But a policy uh, a transformation uh, will will have its own consequences, and you want to sort of use that flexibility to accommodate this. Mm. I think becomes an issue because the the ultimate test of a rule is credibility. You know how once you set it up, yeah. how yeah. committed are you to adhering to it? This this is true of inflation targeting. This is true of uh, fiscal rules or any rule for that matter. Uh, and if you undermine credibility in whatever fashion, uh, then the value of the rule is gone. Then you might as well just go back to a discretionary kind of uh, framework. So if you're committing to a rule, mm -hmm. I'm talking generally, I'm not yeah, talking yeah, specifically yeah. of India. Yeah. If you're committing to rule, then I think you have to accommodate the possibility or the, 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 the reality that uh, there are very, very limited circumstances under which uh, the that. system will, will, will tolerate uh, uh, deviation. Mm -hmm. Before you know, uh, before sort of saying, look, there's you know, uh, there's no credibility to that rule. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I think the benefits of the rule also have to be seen. Why are you getting into rules in the first place? Uh, it is largely because, uh, in the absence of a rule, the kind of fiscal space that you need to pursue what might be considered sort of high priority, you know, national interest and you know, growth and inclusion and all of those those very, very critical objectives. Mm. Uh, that space remains, mm. uh, you know, and for example, if you are committing to an infrastructure, a publicly funded infrastructure strategy, uh, and one year down the road, uh, you know, something happens which reduces the resources flowing into this, your, your strategy falls apart because yeah. you cannot be you know, stop and go mm. on these kinds of commitments. Mm. Now we have many requirements that are going to uh, put pressure on the fiscal situation from long-term perspective. You have to make commitments and you have to be consistent in your commitments over time. Infrastructure is, is sure. the primary example, but there are sure. others as well. And if you're not able to adhere to those commitments, mm. the strategy falls apart. So I think rules help in allowing the government to make these kind of longer term commitments with mm. credibility, mm. with assurance that the resources are going to be there, mm. and that people can actually come in, whether it's PPP or SPVs or whatever yeah. mechanism, yeah. Yeah. that you can actually start doing that, you know, putting those things uh, into play. You also represent countries such as Bangladesh and Sri Lanka yeah. um, on the board of the um, IMF. Um, the one puzzle uh, for us here in India is our exports growth. Um, just when the IMF projects 4% growth in volumes, which is, I think, the highest in about six, seven years, right. um, and there's robust growth everywhere, India's exports are languishing, certainly uh, losing market share in um, sectors such as textiles and apparels to countries such as Bangladesh. Um, what, I mean, you've, you've, I'm assuming you've observed uh, uh, these countries uh, quite closely. So, why you, can you explain what explains uh, some of the rise of Bangladesh in the world exports market? I think uh, Bangladesh, 80% uh, of Bangladesh exports are garments. Yeah. And I think what you're seeing to some extent is the power of, uh, of concentration, of focus, but also along with the focus uh, comes come big risks you know you, this the system has to be sensitive so when you say focus is like policy focus uh, well you know if you if you it's it's like a you could say a sort of picking winners kind of thing uh -huh. so which is, is the doing whole that. system uh -huh. is geared towards uh, satisfying and meeting the requirements the interests of the of the garment industry because yeah. it's so dominant in their in yeah. their uh, yeah. so on the on their radar screen uh, and so everything that comes in their way is is dealt with fairly quickly, and it's paid off. I mean, in terms of growth, in terms of the employment that uh, uh, that garment manufacturing generates, 
uh, and the garment manufacturing community, the constituency, has become a very influential uh, uh, community in terms of uh, their, their impact on policy decisions. So if there's a problem, they are heard, and there's a, you know, every attempt made to, mm. to address it. Uh, we are much more diversified. We have multiple uh, mm. uh, lobbies or constituencies. Mm. And so being able to focus on one thing, I think, is, is a little more challenging for us. We've had successes mm. uh, in the past where, where pockets have worked. Uh, ID. ID, IDES is one yeah. example. Auto, auto components is another. Pharma is a third. There are a number of them. But as people have pointed out, these are not necessarily the sort of labor-intensive, you know, traditional labor-intensive manufacturing activity that we would like to succeed in, uh, where our exports perhaps have, have languished a bit. Uh, so I think where we know any policy lessons, a specific policy uh, lessons. I think the the larger debate in India on facilitating employment through reform of the uh, labor regulations, uh, through a combination of uh, market flexibility, safety net, and skills. That's the to me the triangular sort yeah. of uh, you know model for for employment generation. Uh, we have to try that. We have to put effort, and so it doesn't confine itself to garments. Garments will be one part of it, but there are other things that can benefit from this combination of, of So, But is there reform. empirical evidence from Bangladesh, for example? I mean, did they <clears throat> uh, indulge in labor reforms? Oh, absolutely. Um, they, they, they had no legacy of the Industrial Disputes Act okay. and its reform. So okay. the Bangladeshi labor market is, in a sense, what we have been aspiring to, which is great flexibility. So if, if business uh, slumps, uh, there is no nothing that prevents workers from being fired. But because there is so much buoyancy in the in the industry, uh, jobs are not very difficult to to come by. So in a sense, there is a safety net provided by that focus. Yeah. Because yeah. you know, not the whole industry isn't going to slump at the same time. Individual producers may, and so they're clustered. Uh, you know, so that if, if you lose, it's Silicon Valley, you know, clustering sure. the benefits. If, a, if an IT company shut down, you can go there to are five one. others that will, are willing to hire your particular skill set. And in a sense, that is what works with clusters. Uh, we've had successful clusters where, you know, the safety net that the cluster itself provides is, is, is quite effective. If, if, uh, Even in textiles, we've in, had clusters. Yes, yeah. Ludhiana Correct. and so on, exactly. many others. Uh, but in many other industries also, where yeah. the, so one has to appreciate the safety net contribution of clusters themselves, so that if the worker is not threatened by the fact that a particular employer is going to shut down, uh, then he is or she is that therefore that much more willing to accept the contract that in, indicates flexibility. So I think we got to build a labor strategy based on these three elements. We have to have give the employer flexibility. We have to provide some sort of a safety net, which have, may have different components. Yeah. There may be an unemployment mm. payment. There may be a sort of a mm. clustering benefit. Mm. And we have to be quite responsive to the changing skill requirements. So sure. how do, who pro produces this? I mean, is it entirely responsible to the state? Is it you know, a combination of, of state and is it a public-private partnership kind of uh, yeah. thing that yeah. works? But unless we bring these elements together, I think competitiveness is going to uh, to be sort of somewhat lagging or somewhat less than than it is. And and you see this um, across, say, other countries such as Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. Or, or, I mean, this I, is I think keep in mind, you know, when we look at the origins of the special economic zone model, yeah, uh, we we certainly pay a lot of attention to China. Right. Uh, but the originator, to, in my understanding of this model, was Malaysia. Why Malaysia did it is very interesting. Uh, Malaysia imposed a whole set of restrictions on domestic enterprise mm. uh, through the Bhumiputra requirements, which is the, the, the employment of employment, ownership, Local other preferential rights. treatment. But they realized that this was not helping, you know, industry to grow. They couldn't dis dismantle it because of the domestic political, uh, uh, you know, the configuration, the considerations. So the zones were created as a way to exempt enterprise located in the zones from all of these requirements. Mm. So essentially created a dual mm. regulatory framework which mm. put a completely different set of rules, laissez-faire, open, no uh, restrictions hiring, no restrictions mm. firing, and their exports took off. Now China followed that. 
by creating special economic zones in the late 70s, early 80s, mm. they essentially exempted enterprises located in those rules, mm. uh, in those zones, from all the rules Correct. that applied to yeah. so domestic islands, and yeah. uh, So, you know, labor market flexibility was was built into that model. They started to expand it into the interiors uh, in the early 90s, mm. but for the first 10 years of their 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 regime. Uh, the zones were exempt. Now we had this debate in the mid 2000s about you know can we create zones where uh, labor laws are, for example, not applicable. Uh, that debate went in the way of look a one country one legal system uh, argument, and you know there are merits to that. Correct. But I think we have to understand that if we are trying to replicate the success of these countries, then we have there to are some very core lessons that come from labor market uh, policies that these countries followed. I don't think we can ignore those lessons. But the only point that I would make in that regard, uh, Subir, is you know, labor in the Indian context is what we call a state subject, um, right? And uh, in this uh, framework of competitive federalism, um, if labor markets were um, you know, uh, such a roadblock to, uh, uh, to, to export prosperity, if I can call it that, Surely some states would have tried it, and because it's at the state level, they, we would have seen some sort of competitive forces kicking in. Well, we've seen this. We've seen Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh doing it. Uh, we we've seen the change. We haven't seen the outcomes yet. Right? Well, we you know, let's look, let's look at, I think this is an important consideration because we are seeing, you know, states uh, competing to, uh, to outrank each other in the domestic ease of doing business uh, mm -hmm. framework. And you have states who are ranked very high on that list, but don't seem to be sort of you know showing immediate response. And immediate, I think, is in any case unrealistic. Since we're talking jobs, and um, I've heard you talk uh, quite passionately about the threat or the opportunity of uh, technology and um, automation or artificial intelligence, whatever how we, we want to call it. Um, first, uh, you know, since again, given your kind of vantage point um, in, in Washington, um, how is this playing out in some of the other emerging markets that you're seeing, the, uh, the threat or the opportunity of automation, and then talk about uh, its impact, potential impact on right. India? Well, I'm particularly, since I represent, uh, you know, countries that are, three of whom are quite, uh, in, quite sort of have big stakes in government uh, yeah. exports. Uh, I'm particularly watching uh, the entry of automation into Garment. processing of soft material. Okay. Uh, you know, so far we've had robots making significant in automation, broadly speaking, yeah. robots is, is a bit humanizing yeah. it, but it's automation of the process uh, into hard material processing, and certainly in the auto, uh, auto sector, or plastics, or, or even wood, me metal processing in general, they've been, you know, steadily sort yeah. of uh, entering this, uh, the system. So two fact, two issues which I'm watching, which I I think we need to be concerned about. I'm not yet at the point where I can sort of categorize it as a threat uh, or an, an opportunity, opportunity, but I think we have to be thinking about these in okay. a somewhat more you know, organized and uh, systematic fashion. And I'd, I'd like to sort of contribute to that uh, debate uh, you know, as, we, as we move forward. Uh, one on the soft material processing side, we have the entry of what are called SOBOTs, S-E-W-B-O-T-S. Uh, yeah. which are actually starting to show success in garment manufacture. There are a number of ways in which they do it, but bottom line is that uh, it will be people displacing if it succeeds in this part of the world and you know our neighbors to the east who are all quite heavily invested into garments. Uh, this is something we need to be watching out for because it can be very disruptive if garment manufacturing suddenly shifts its geographical access to to back to the where the big markets are and you know uh, are manufactured by machines. We're already seeing this in footwear. We saw the the Nike robot made shoe, you know, uh, unveiled at the Rio Olympics and starting to get into the into the uh, shoe stores now. And I think garments are not that far away. Mm. Uh, they're already being made, but at scale and so on, which which the low cost, low end of the market, which is what uh, these countries cater to, mm. uh, it, it's not that far away. That's one I think we have to be concerned about. If, if this happens, uh, how do we respond to it? I mean, what, what is our, do, we, do we locate those robots here, in which case, uh, but then there's no particular reason, there's no geographic uh, yeah. compulsion to do it. If you're not using people, then you don't need to locate where the people are. Uh, you, you can locate where the markets are. Uh, the second thing is, uh, one thing I think which we've got to be watching out for is the penetration of automation and AI 
into what are called public relation functions, and that is essentially what our call centers, our business process mm -hmm. outsourcing does. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally, you know, dealt with this, and it took me a while to realize I was talking to a machine <laughs> when I was when I was you know trying to solve some problem with my with my cable uh, connection. Uh, they're very empathetic Couldn't sounding. Have had good. They're very empathetic sounding. They don't do not sound like that that sort of uh, machine uh, language. And uh, the first time I did it, I it told me it was passing me on to a human operator, which uh, oh. then who solved then solved my problem. The second time I used it, it actually took me through a set of uh, instructions, and I was I solved the problem without having to to mm. talk to a, to a human operator. And I think you know when we the kind of investment we have made and the success we've had with with uh, with BPO uh, is clearly uh, under some sort of a threat right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you know how are we going to respond to this? Uh, uh, you know there is an aspirational aspect to BPO employment. It is seen as white collar, computer oriented, and so on. So yeah. a lot of people who are finishing school, you know, see this as mm -hmm. uh, sort of their entry into the mm -hmm. middle class or that down that trajectory. Uh, if it gets disrupted, how are we going to deal with it? So I think there are both significant economic uh, dimensions to this issue and there are social dimensions social to this issue. Yes, and, yes. and, you know, we've been talking uh, off camera about inequality and its consequences. Right, right. I'm, I'm and this, this, that, yeah. is, this is a big, big part of that story as well. See, on automation and um, its impact on the textiles and apparel sector, since you brought up, um, and I'm using that as an example, um, of course, one could say, you know, listen, there were sewing machines, single sewing machines that came yeah, in, yeah. and we dealt with that transition. Yeah. In hindsight, it all seems fine. Okay, we've, we've transitioned uh, seamlessly. So why would it be different um, uh, with this transition? Interesting point, and I've been trying to place this transition in some historical context as I try and understand it. Uh, it's absolutely correct to say that uh, previous episodes of significant technical or technological disruption uh, have over time generally contributed positively. That is, you've seen significant increases in productivity, labor productivity. You've seen significant increase in, in household incomes as a result of that. And you've seen significant opening up of opportunities outside the core, yeah. uh, which has allowed people to make the transitions. I mean, there would have been individual losers unquestionably. But at a social level, uh, these new opportunities, uh, you know, emerged, uh, systems emerged to provide skills for these new opportunities in whatever fashion, whether through formal education or through vocational training or whatever it is. So societies uh, on the whole uh, were able to demonstrate responsiveness to these uh, changes in ways that allowed them to sort of take advantage of them. And then the next one came along and you know went through a similar process. Mm -hmm. So I don't dispute, or to me, that's why I said I'm, I'm agnostic on, on the eventual outcome. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to be prepared for it. You know, I don't How? think that to me is the, is the question that you know, this process must be asking. I don't have answers. Okay. I want to flag the fact that if we, it can hit us hard uh, and it can hit us adversely, if we are not adequately prepared. Now, if you reach a judgment that, look, we don't need to do anything different, uh, and that is a collective wisdom of, of people saying that, okay, it, it comes, it comes, we deal with it, things uh, things. Or maybe work. we can't do anything about it. Uh, or we can't do anything about it. Well, then we say, okay, that's uh, that's where it stands. Mm. But if we, I think we need to think this through. Mm. You know, are there mm. things that we need to do differently, both uh, at a public policy level and at a sort of business or commercial level? Uh, education and skilling. The political economy response to a, a, a threat like this would, the natural response would be to raise barriers, um, to protect the immediate, and not so much worry about. It. But that's the incentive um, uh, st structure in a, in, a, in a democracy that's that's as fixed tenures. That's a larger worry, isn't it? From the, the policy response to it, and it could be a race to the bottom. Yeah. In fact, uh, one of the most significant uh, findings uh, in a chapter in the World Economic Outlook that the fund produces mm -hmm. every uh, six months, and has uh, each one has a few analytical chapters. Uh, 2016, I think they did one on trade, and what was so when we're talking about slowing exports, that has been a trend globally. So it's, we are not unique in experiencing slowing exports. Uh, but one important contributor to that 
global trend uh, has been the rise of protectionism mm. in variety of forms, mm. uh, direct trade barriers, other sort of indirect measures, and so on. And I think that is, as you're saying, it's it's almost a uh, you know if there's very little else you can do in the short term to uh, to resist this pressure. So this is a tempting. So it, it, you have some sovereign powers to to raise trade barriers, as we've as we're seeing in the the world trade process, the mm. WTO minister that just concluded a few days ago, that this is now starting to have some bearing, either directly or indirectly, on the comfort that the, the world has had with an open trading regime to whatever extent it is. So if we start to see rollbacks in this this platform, this this mutual understanding, um, that could have consequences you know, uh, yeah, across the yeah. board. So I think it's very important for us to act collectively to at least protect what we have, to preserve what we have on the global trading regime. I think that, that's an important objective. Uh, the, the aspiration to take it further, I think, as we can see, we've got to be realistic. There isn't any particular appetite. But at least let, let not uh, that uh, resistance sort of start pushing back and, no. and reducing. So that's a global understanding which we have to try and achieve. We have to work with other countries to to to, to so get that's that. that's on trade. The policy response on technology could be very similar. I mean, I know Bill Gates called it a robot tax or whatever, but I mean, I I can understand how tempting it can be from a political economy perspective yeah. uh, to have something like a, a machine tax. So, so these responses are often based on, I think, an immediate, quick grasp a quick inference drawn from these forces uh, without necessarily putting them into their into their wider context. I worry sometimes by raising this as an issue, the technology, it may trigger an adverse short-term policy response that could actually be worse in the longer uh, 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 That's That's why I think we have to understand it as, as fully and as completely as possible. Sure, You're sure. right, you know, I mean, scare mongering is, is quite easy to do. Uh, but so is denial, you know, that's also Absolutely. easy to do. So somewhere between the scaring and denial, you I think is, we have to find the middle ground. I think that's, that's, that's what, yeah. you know, long-term yeah. policy thinking sure. should, should yeah. focus on. Great. No, that, this was a wonderful conversation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Thanks Sameer. for and hosting thanks for, me. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Are we live?